section four of evolution creatrice by henri bergson translated by arthur mitchell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one part four it is well known that lamarck attributed to the living being the power of varying by use or disuse of its organs and also of passing on the variation so acquired to its descendants a certain number of biologists hold a doctrine of this kind today the variation that results in a new species is not they believe merely an accidental variation inherent in the germ itself nor is it governed by a determinism sui generis which develops definite characters in a definite direction apart from every consideration of utility it springs from the very effort of the living being to adapt itself to the circumstances of its existence the effort may indeed be only the mechanical exercise of certain organs mechanically elicited by the pressure of external circumstances but it may also imply consciousness and will and it is in this sense that it appears to be understood by one of the most eminent representatives of the doctrine the american naturalist cope neo-lamarckism is therefore of all the later forms of evolutionism the only one capable of admitting an internal and psychological principle of development although it is not bound to do so and it is also the only evolutionism that seems to us to account for the building up of identical complex organs on independent lines of development for it is quite conceivable that the same effort to turn the same circumstances to good account might have the same result especially if the problem put by the circumstances is such as to admit of only one solution but the question remains whether the term effort must not then be taken in a deeper sense a sense even more psychological than any neo lamarckian supposes for a mere variation of size is one thing and a change of form is another that an organ can be strengthened and grow by exercise nobody will deny but it is a long way from that to the progressive development of an eye like that of the mollusks and of the vertebrates if this development be ascribed to the influence of light long continued but passively received we fall back on the theory we have just criticized if on the other hand an internal activity is appealed to then it must be something quite different from what we usually call an effort for never has an effort been known to produce the slightest complication of an organ and yet an enormous number of complications all admirably coordinated have been necessary to pass from the pigment spot of the infusorian to the eye of the vertebrate but even if we accept this notion of the evolutionary process in the case of animals how can we apply it to plants here variations of form do not seem to imply nor always to lead to functional changes and even if the cause of the variation is of a psychological nature we can hardly call it an effort unless we give a very unusual extension to the meaning of the word the truth is it is necessary to dig beneath the effort itself and look for a deeper cause this is especially necessary we believe if we wish to get at a cause of regular hereditary variations we are not going to enter here into the controversies over the transmissibility of acquired characters still less do we wish to take too definite a side on this question which is not within our province but we cannot remain completely indifferent to it nowhere is it clear that philosophers can not today content themselves with vague generalities but must follow the scientists in experimental detail and to discuss the results with them if spencer had begun by putting to himself the question of the hereditability of acquired characters his evolutionism would no doubt have taken an altogether different form if as seems probable to us a habit contracted by the individual or transmitted to its descendants only in very exceptional cases all the spencerian psychology would need remaking and a large part of spencer's philosophy would fall to pieces let us say then how the problem seems to us to present itself and in what direction an attempt might be made to solve it after having been affirmed as a dogma the transmissibility of acquired characters has been no less dogmatically denied for reasons drawn a priori from the supposed nature of germinal cells it is well known how weismann was led by his hypothesis of the continuity of the germplasm to regard the germinal cells ova and spermatozoa as almost independent of the somatic cells starting from this it has been claimed and is still claimed by many that the hereditary transmission of an acquired character is inconceivable but if perchance experiment should show that acquired characters are transmissible it would prove thereby that the germplasm is not so independent of the somatic envelope as has been contended and the transmissibility of acquired characters would become ipso facto conceivable 
which amounts to saying that conceivability and inconceivability have nothing to do with the case and that experience alone must settle the matter but it is just here that the difficulty begins the acquired characters we are speaking of are generally habits or the effects of habit and at the root of most habits there is a natural disposition so that one can always ask whether it is really the habit acquired by the soma of the individual that is transmitted or whether it is not rather a natural aptitude which existed prior to the habit this aptitude would have remained inherent in the germ plasm which the individual bears within him as it was in the individual himself and consequently in the germ whence he sprang thus for instance there is no proof that the mole has become blind because it has formed the habit of living underground it is perhaps because its eyes were becoming atrophied that it condemned itself to a life underground if this is the case the tendency to lose the power of vision has been transmitted from germ to germ without anything being acquired or lost by the soma of the mole itself from the fact that the son of a fencing master has become a good fencer much more quickly than his father we cannot infer that the habit of the parent has been transmitted to the child for certain natural dispositions in course of growth may have passed from the plasma engendering the father to the plasma engendering the son may have grown on the way by the effect of the primitive impetus and thus assured to the son a greater suppleness than the father had without troubling so to speak about what the father did so of many examples drawn from the progressive domestication of animals it is hard to say whether it is the acquired habit that is transmitted or only a certain natural tendency that indeed which has caused such and such a particular species or certain of its representatives to be specially chosen for domestication the truth is when every doubtful case every fact open to more than one interpretation has been eliminated there remains hardly a single unquestionable example of acquired and transmitted peculiarities beyond the famous experiments of brown secau repeated and confirmed by other physiologists by cutting the spinal cord or the sciatic nerve of guinea pigs brown secau brought about an epileptic state which was transmitted to the descendants lesions of the same sciatic nerve of the restiform body etc provoked various troubles in the guinea pig which its progeny inherited sometimes in a quite different form exophthalmia loss of toes etc but it is not demonstrated that in these different cases of hereditary transmission there had been a real influence of the soma of the animal on its germplasm weismann at once objected that the operations of brown secar might have introduced certain special microbes into the body of the guinea pig which had found their means of nutrition in the nervous tissues and transmitted the malady by penetrating into the sexual elements this objection has been answered by brown secar himself but a more plausible one might be raised some experiments of voisin and perron have shown that fits of epilepsy are followed by the elimination of a toxic body which when injected into animals is capable of producing convulsive symptoms perhaps the trophic disorders following the nerve lesions made by brown secar correspond to the formation of precisely this convulsion causing poison if so the toxin passed from the guinea pig to its spermatozoan or ovum and caused in the development of the embryo a general disturbance which however had no visible effects except at one point or another of the organism when developed in that case what occurred would have been somewhat the same as in the experiments of charin delamare and moussou where guinea pigs in gestation whose liver or kidney was injured transmitted the lesion to their progeny simply because the injury to the mother's organ had given rise to specific cytotoxins which acted on the corresponding organ of the fetus it is true that in these experiments as in a former observation of the same physiologists it was the already formed fetus that was influenced by the toxins but other researches of charin have resulted in showing that the same effect may be produced by an analogous process on the spermatozoa and the ova to conclude then the inheritance of an acquired peculiarity in the experiments of brown secar can be explained by the effect of a toxin on the germ the lesion however well localized it seems is transmitted by the same process as for instance the taint of alcoholism but may it not be the same in the case of every acquired peculiarity that has become hereditary there is indeed one point on which both those who affirm and those who deny the transmissibility of acquired characters are agreed namely that certain influences such as that of alcohol can affect at the same time both the living being and the germ plasm it contains in such case there is inheritance of a defect and the result is as if the soma of the parent had acted on the germ plasm although in reality soma and plasma have simply both suffered the action of the same cause 
now suppose that the soma can influence the germ plasm as those believe who hold that acquired characters are transmissible is not the most natural hypothesis to suppose that things happen in this second case as in the first and that the direct effect of the influence of the soma is a general alteration of the germ plasm if this is the case it is by exception and in some sort by accident that the modification of the descendant is the same as that of the parent it is like the hereditability of the alcoholic taint it passes from father to children but it may take a different form in each child and in none of them be like what it was in the father let the letter c represent the change in the plasm c being either positive or negative that is to say showing either the gain or loss of certain substances the effect will not be an exact reproduction of the cause nor will the change in the germ plasm provoked by a certain modification of a certain part of the soma determine a similar modification of the corresponding part of the new organism in process of formation unless all the other nascent parts of this organism enjoy a kind of immunity as regards c the same part will then undergo alteration in the new organism because it happens that the development of this part is alone subject to the new influence and even then the part might be altered in an entirely different way from that in which the corresponding part was altered in the generating organism we should propose then to introduce a distinction between the hereditability of deviation and that of character an individual which acquires a new character thereby deviates from the form it previously had which form the germs or often the half germs it contains would have reproduced in their development if this modification does not involve the production of substances capable of changing the germ plasm or does not so affect nutrition as to deprive the germ plasm of certain of its elements it will have no effect on the offspring of the individual this is probably the case as a rule if on the contrary it has some effect this is likely to be due to a chemical change which is as induced in the germ plasm this chemical change might by exception bring about the original modification again in the organism which the germ is about to develop but there are as many and more chances that it will do something else in this latter case the generated organism will perhaps deviate from the normal type as much as the generating organism but it will do so differently it will have inherited deviation and not character in general therefore the habits formed by an individual have probably no echo in its offspring and when they have the modification in the descendants may have no visible likeness to the original one such at least is the hypothesis which seems to us most likely in any case in default of proof to the contrary and so long as the decisive experiments called for by an eminent biologist have not been made we must keep to the actual results of observation now even if we take the most favorable view of the theory of the transmissibility of acquired characters and assume that the ostensible acquired character is not in most cases the more or less tardy development of an innate character facts show us that hereditary transmission is the exception and not the rule how then shall we expect it to develop an organ such as the eye when we think of the enormous number of variations all in the same direction that we must suppose to be accumulated before the passage from the pigment spot of the infusorian to the eye of the mollusk and of the vertebrate is possible we do not see how heredity as we observe it could ever have determined this piling up of differences even supposing that individual efforts could have produced each of them singly that is to say that neo-lamarckism is no more able than any other form of evolutionism to solve the problem in thus submitting the various present forms of evolutionism to a common test in showing that they all strike against the same insurmountable difficulty we have in no wise the intention of rejecting them altogether on the contrary each of them being supported by a considerable number of facts must be true in its way each of them must correspond to a certain aspect of the process of evolution perhaps even it is necessary that a theory should restrict itself exclusively to a particular point of view in order to remain scientific that is to give a precise direction to researchers into detail but the reality of which each of these theories takes a partial view must transcend them all and this reality is the special object of philosophy which is not constrained to scientific precision because it contemplates no practical application let us therefore indicate in a word or two the positive contribution that each of the three present forms of evolutionism seems to us to make toward the solution of the problem what each of them leaves out 
and on what point this threefold effort should in our opinion converge in order to obtain a more comprehensive although thereby of necessity a less definite idea of the evolutionary process the neo-darwinians are probably right we believe when they teach that the essential causes of variation are the differences inherent in the germ borne by the individual and not the experiences or behavior of the individual in the course of his career where we fail to follow these biologists is in regarding the differences inherent in the germ as purely accidental and individual we cannot help believing that these differences are the development of an impulsion which passes from germ to germ across the individuals that they are therefore not pure accidents and that they might well appear at the same time in the same form in all the representatives of the same species or at least in a certain number of them already in fact the theory of mutations is modifying darwinism profoundly on this point it asserts that at a given moment after a long period the entire species is beset with a tendency to change the tendency to change therefore is not accidental true the change itself would be accidental since the mutation works according to de Vries, in different directions in the different representatives of the species but first we must see if the theory is confirmed by many other vegetable species de Vries has verified it only by the inothera lamarckiana and then there is the possibility as we shall explain further on that the part played by chance is much greater in the variation of plants than in that of animals because in the vegetable world function does not depend so strictly on form be that as it may the neo-darwinians are inclined to admit that the periods of mutation are determinate the direction of the mutation may therefore be so as well at least in animals and to the extent we shall have to indicate we thus arrive at a hypothesis like Eimer's, according to which the variations of different characters continue from generation to generation in definite directions this hypothesis seems plausible to us within the limits in which Eimer himself retains it of course the evolution of the organic world cannot be predetermined as a whole we claim on the contrary that the spontaneity of life is manifested by a continual creation of new forms succeeding others but this indetermination cannot be complete it must leave a certain part to determination an organ like the eye for example must have been formed by just a continual changing in a definite direction indeed we do not see how otherwise to explain the likeness of structure of the eye in species that have not the same history where we differ from Eimer is in his claim that combinations of physical and chemical causes are enough to secure the result we have tried to prove on the contrary by the example of the eye that if there is orthogenesis here a psychological cause intervenes certain neo-lamarckians do indeed resort to a cause of a psychological nature there to our thinking is one of the most solid positions of neo-lamarckism but if this cause is nothing but the conscious effort of the individual it cannot operate in more than a restricted number of cases at most in the animal world and not at all in the vegetable kingdom even in animals it will act only on points which are under the direct or indirect control of the will and even where it does act it is not clear how it could compass a change so profound as an increase of complexity at most this would be conceivable if the acquired characters were regularly transmitted so as to be added together but this transmission seems to be the exception rather than the rule a hereditary change in a definite direction which continues to accumulate and add to itself so as to build up a more and more complex machine must certainly be related to some sort of effort but to an effort of far greater depth than the individual effort far more independent of circumstances an effort common to most representatives of the same species inherent in the germs they bear rather than in their substance alone an effort thereby assured of being passed on to their descendants so we come back by a somewhat roundabout way to the idea we started from that of an original impetus of life passing from one generation of germs to the following generation of germs through the developed organisms which bridge the interval between the generations this impetus sustained right along the lines of evolution among which it gets divided is the fundamental cause of variations at least of those that are regularly passed on that accumulate and create new species in general when species have begun to diverge from a common stock they accentuate their divergence as they progress in their evolution yet in certain definite points they may evolve identically in fact they must do so if the hypothesis of a common impetus be accepted 
this is just what we shall have to show now in a more precise way by the same example we have chosen the formation of the eye in mollusks and vertebrates the idea of an original impetus moreover will thus be made clearer two points are equally striking in an organ like the eye the complexity of its structure and the simplicity of its function the eye is composed of distinct parts such as the sclerotic the cornea the retina the crystalline lens etc in each of these parts the detail is infinite the retina alone comprises three layers of nervous elements multipolar cells bipolar cells visual cells each of which has its individuality and is undoubtedly a very complicated organism so complicated indeed is the retinal membrane in its intimate structure that no simple description can give an adequate idea of it the mechanism of the eye is in short composed of an infinity of mechanisms all of extreme complexity yet vision is one simple fact as soon as the eye opens the visual act is effected just because the act is simple the slightest negligence on the part of nature in the building of the infinitely complex machine would have made vision impossible this contrast between the complexity of the organ and the unity of the function is what gives us pause a mechanistic theory is one which means to show us the gradual building up of the machine under the influence of external circumstances intervening either directly by action on the tissues or indirectly by the selection of better adapted ones but whatever form this theory may take supposing it avails at all to explain the detail of the parts it throws no light on their correlation then comes the doctrine of finality which says that the parts have been brought together on a preconceived plan with a view to a certain end in this it likens the labour of nature to that of the workman who also proceeds by the assemblage of parts with a view to the realization of an idea or the imitation of a model mechanism here reproaches finalism with its anthropomorphic character and rightly but it fails to see that itself proceeds according to this method somewhat mutilated true it has got rid of the end pursued or the ideal model but it also holds that nature has worked like a human being by bringing parts together while a mere glance at the development of an embryo shows that life goes to work in a very different way life does not proceed by the association and addition of elements but by dissociation and division we must get beyond both points of view both mechanism and finalism being at bottom only standpoints to which the human mind has been led by considering the work of man but in what direction can we go beyond them we have said that in analyzing the structure of an organ we can go on decomposing forever although the function of the whole is a simple thing this contrast between the infinite complexity of the organ and the extreme simplicity of the function is what should open our eyes in general when the same object appears in one aspect and in another as infinitely complex the two aspects have by no means the same importance or rather the same degree of reality in such cases the simplicity belongs to the object itself and the infinite complexity to the views we take in turning around it to the symbols by which our senses or intellect represent it to us or more generally to elements of a different order with which we try to imitate it artificially but with which it remains incommensurable being of a different nature an artist of genius has painted a figure on his canvas we can imitate his picture with many coloured squares of mosaic and we shall reproduce the curves and shades of the model so much the better as our squares are smaller more numerous and more varied in tone but an infinity of elements infinitely small presenting an infinity of shades would be necessary to obtain the exact equivalent of the figure that the artist has conceived as a simple thing which he has wished to transport as a whole to the canvas and which is the more complete the more it strikes us as the projection of an indivisible intuition now suppose our eyes so made that they cannot help seeing in the work of the master a mosaic effect or suppose our intellect so made that it cannot explain the appearance of the figure on the canvas except as a work of mosaic we should then be able to speak simply of a collection of little squares and we should be under the mechanistic hypothesis we might add that beside the materiality of the collection there must be a plan on which the artist worked and then we should be expressing ourselves as finalists but in neither case should we have got at the real process for there are no squares brought together it is the picture that is the simple act projected on the canvas which by the mere fact of entering into our perception is decomposed before our eyes into thousands and thousands of little squares which present as recomposed a wonderful arrangement 
so the eye with its marvellous complexity of structure may be only the simple act of vision divided for us into a mosaic of cells whose order seems marvellous to us because we have conceived the whole as an assemblage if i raise my hand from a to b this movement appears to me under two aspects at once felt from within it is a simple indivisible act perceived from without it is the course of a certain curve a b in this curve i can distinguish as many positions as i please and the line itself might be defined as a certain mutual coordination of these positions but the positions infinite in number and the order in which they are connected have sprung automatically from the indivisible act by which my hand has gone from a to b mechanism here would consist in seeing only the positions finalism would take their order into account but both mechanism and finalism would leave on one side the movement which is reality itself in one sense the movement is more than the positions and than their order for it is sufficient to make it in its indivisible simplicity to secure that the infinity of the successive positions as also their order be given at once with something else which is neither order nor position but which is essential the mobility but in another sense the movement is less than the series of positions and their connecting order for to arrange points in a certain order it is necessary first to conceive the order and then to realize it with points there must be the work of assemblage and there must be intelligence whereas the simple movement of the hand contains nothing of either it is not intelligent in the human sense of the word and it is not an assemblage for it is not made up of elements just so with the relation of the eye to vision there is in vision more than the component cells of the eye and their mutual coordination in this sense neither mechanism nor finalism go far enough but in another sense mechanism and finalism both go too far for they attribute to nature the most formidable of the labours of hercules in holding that she has exalted to the simple act of vision an infinity of infinitely complex elements whereas nature has had no more trouble in making an eye than i have in lifting my hand nature's simple act has divided itself automatically into an infinity of elements which are then found to be coordinated to one idea just as the movement of my hand has dropped an infinity of points which are then found to satisfy one equation we find it very hard to see things in that light because we cannot help conceiving organization as manufacturing but it is one thing to manufacture and quite another to organize manufacturing is peculiar to man it consists in assembling parts of matter which we have cut out in such manner that we can fit them together and obtain from them a common action the parts are arranged so to speak around the action as an ideal centre to manufacture therefore is to work from the periphery to the centre or as the philosophers say from the many to the one organization on the contrary works from the centre to the periphery it begins in a point that is almost a mathematical point and spreads around this point by concentric waves which go on enlarging the work of manufacturing is the more effective the greater the quantity of matter dealt with it proceeds by concentration and compression the organizing act on the contrary has something explosive about it it needs at the beginning the smallest possible place the minimum of matter as if the organizing forces only entered space reluctantly the spermatozoon which sets in motion the evolutionary process of the embryonic life is one of the smallest cells of the organism and it is only a small part of the spermatozoon which really takes part in the operation but these are only superficial differences digging beneath them we think a deeper difference would be found a manufactured thing delineates exactly the form of the work of manufacturing it i mean that the manufacturer finds in his product exactly what he has put into it if he is going to make a machine he cuts out its pieces one by one and then puts them together the machine when made will show both the pieces and their assemblage the whole of the result represents the whole of the work and to each part of the work corresponds a part of the result now i recognize that positive science can and should proceed as if organization was like making a machine only so will it have any hold on organized bodies for its object is not to show us the essence of things but to furnish us with the best means of acting on them physics and chemistry are well advanced sciences and living matter lends itself to our action only so far as we can treat it by the processes of our physics and chemistry organization can therefore only be studied scientifically if the organized body has first been likened to a machine the cells will be the pieces of the machine the organism their assemblage and the elementary labors which have organized the parts will be regarded as the real elements of the labor which has organized the whole 
this is the standpoint of science quite different in our opinion is that of philosophy for us the whole of an organized machine may strictly speaking represent the whole of the organizing work this is however only approximately true yet the parts of the machine do not correspond to parts of the work because the materiality of this machine does not represent a sum of means employed but a sum of obstacles avoided it is a negation rather than a positive reality so as we have shown in a former study vision is a power which should attain by right an infinity of things inaccessible to our eyes but such a vision would not be continued into action it might suit a phantom but not a living being the vision of a living being is an effective vision limited to objects on which the being can act it is a vision that is canalized and the visual apparatus simply symbolizes the work of canalizing therefore the creation of the visual apparatus is no more explained by the assembling of its anatomic elements than the digging of a canal could be explained by the heaping up of the earth which might have formed its banks a mechanistic theory would maintain that the earth had been brought cartload by cartload finalism would add that it had not been dumped down at random that the carters had followed a plan but both theories would be mistaken for the canal has been made in another way with greater precision we may compare the process by which nature constructs an eye to the simple act by which we raise the hand but we supposed at first that the hand met with no resistance let us now imagine that instead of moving in air the hand has to pass through iron filings which are compressed and offer resistance to it in proportion as it goes forward at a certain moment the hand will have exhausted its effort and at this very moment the filings will be massed and coordinated in a certain definite form to wit that of the hand that is stopped and of a part of the arm now suppose that the hand and arm are invisible lookers-on will seek the reason of the arrangement in the filings themselves and in forces within the mass some will account for the position of each filing by the action exerted upon it by the neighboring filings these are the mechanists others will prefer to think that a plan of the whole has presided over the detail of these elementary actions they are the finalists but the truth is that there has been merely one indivisible act that of the hand passing through the filings the inexhaustible detail of the movement of the grains as well as the order of their final arrangement expresses negatively in a way this undivided movement being the unitary form of a resistance and not a synthesis of positive elementary actions for this reason if the arrangement of the grains is termed an effect and the movement of the hand a cause it may indeed be said that the whole of the effect is explained by the whole of the cause but to parts of the cause parts of the effect will in no wise correspond in other words neither mechanism nor finalism will here be in place and we must resort to an explanation of a different kind now in the hypothesis we propose the relation of vision to the visual apparatus would be very nearly that of the hand to the iron filings that follow canalize and limit its motion the greater the effort of the hand the farther it will go into the filings but at whatever point it stops instantaneously and automatically the filings coordinate and find their equilibrium so with vision and its organ according as the undivided act constituting vision advances more or less the materiality of the organ is made of a more or less considerable number of mutually coordinated elements but the order is necessarily complete and perfect it could not be partial because once again the real process which gives rise to it has no parts that is what neither mechanism nor finalism takes into account and it is what we also fail to consider when we wonder at the marvellous structure of an instrument such as the eye at the bottom of our wondering is always this idea that it would have been possible for a part only of this coordination to have been realized that the complete realization is a kind of special favor this favor the finalists consider as dispensed to them all at once by the final cause the mechanists claim to obtain it little by little by the effect of natural selection but both see something positive in this coordination and consequently something fractionable in its cause something which admits of every possible degree of achievement in reality the cause though more or less intense cannot produce its effect except in one piece and completely finished according as it goes further and further in the direction of vision it gives the simple pigmentary masses of a lower organism or the rudimentary eye of a serpula or the slightly differentiated eye of the alciope or the marvellously perfected eye of the bird but all these organs unequal as is their complexity necessarily present an equal coordination 
for this reason no matter how distant two animal species may be from each other if the progress toward vision has gone equally far in both there is the same visual organ in each case for the form of the organ only expresses the degree in which the exercise of the function has been obtained but in speaking of a progress toward vision are we not coming back to the old notion of finality it would be so undoubtedly if this progress required the conscious or unconscious idea of an end to be attained but it is really effected in virtue of the original impetus of life it is implied in this movement itself and that is just why it is found in independent lines of evolution if now we are asked why and how it is implied therein we reply that life is more than anything else a tendency to act on inert matter the direction of this action is not predetermined hence the unforeseeable variety of forms which life in evolving sows along its path but this action always presents to some extent the character of contingency it implies at least a rudiment of choice now a choice involves the anticipatory idea of several possible actions possibilities of action must therefore be marked out for the living being before the action itself visual perception is nothing else the visible outlines of bodies are the design of our eventual action on them vision will be found therefore in different degrees in the most diverse animals and it will appear in the same complexity of structure wherever it has reached the same degree of intensity we have dwelt on these resemblances of structure in general and on the example of the eye in particular because we had to define our attitude toward mechanism on the one hand and finalism on the other it remains for us to describe it more precisely in itself this we shall now do by showing the divergent results of evolution not as presenting analogies but as themselves mutually complementary end of section four section five of evolution creatrice by henri bergson translated by arthur mitchell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two part one the divergent directions of the evolution of life torpor intelligence instinct the evolution movement would be a simple one and we should soon have been able to determine its direction if life had described a single course like that of a solid ball shot from a cannon but it proceeds rather like a shell which suddenly bursts into fragments which fragments being themselves shells burst in their turn into fragments destined to burst again and so on for a time incommensurably long we perceive only what is nearest to us namely the scattered movements of the pulverized explosions from them we have to go back stage by stage to the original movement when a shell bursts the particular way it breaks is explained both by the explosive force of the powder it contains and by the resistance of the metal so of the way life breaks into individuals and species it depends we think on two series of causes the resistance life meets from inert matter and the explosive force due to an unstable balance of tendencies which life bears within itself the resistance of inert matter was the obstacle that had first to be overcome life seems to have succeeded in this by dint of humility by making itself very small and very insinuating bending to physical and chemical forces consenting even to go a part of the way with them like the switch that adopts for a while the direction of the rail it is endeavouring to leave of phenomena in the simplest forms of life it is hard to say whether they are still physical and chemical or whether they are already vital life had to enter thus into the habits of inert matter in order to draw it little by little magnetized as it were to another track the animate forms that first appeared were therefore of extreme simplicity they were probably tiny masses of scarcely differentiated protoplasm outwardly resembling the amoeba observable today but possessed of the tremendous internal push that was to raise them even to the highest forms of life that in virtue of this push the first organisms sought to grow as much as possible seems likely but organized matter has a limit of expansion that is very quickly reached beyond a certain point it divides instead of growing ages of effort and prodigies of subtlety were probably necessary for life to get past this new obstacle it succeeded in inducing an increasing number of elements ready to divide to remain united by the division of labor it knotted between them an indissoluble bond 
the complex and quasi discontinuous organism is thus made to function as would a continuous living mass which had simply grown bigger but the real and profound causes of division were those which life bore within its bosom for life is tendency and the essence of a tendency is to develop in the form of a sheaf creating by its very growth divergent directions among which its impetus is divided this we observe in ourselves in the evolution of that special tendency which we call our character each of us glancing back over his history will find that his child personality though indivisible united in itself diverse persons which could remain blended just because they were in their nascent state this indecision so charged with promise is one of the greatest charms of childhood but these interwoven personalities become incompatible in course of growth and as each of us can live but one life a choice must perforce be made we choose in reality without ceasing without ceasing also we abandon many things the route we pursue in time is strewn with the remains of all that we began to be of all that we might have become but nature which has at command an incalculable number of lives is in no wise bound to make such sacrifices she preserves the different tendencies that have bifurcated with their growth she creates with them diverging series of species that will evolve separately these series may moreover be of unequal importance the author who begins a novel puts into his hero many things which he is obliged to discard as he goes on perhaps he will take them up later in other books and make new characters with them who will seem like extracts from or rather like complements of the first but they will almost always appear somewhat poor and limited in comparison with the original character so with regard to the evolution of life the bifurcations on the way have been numerous but there have been many blind alleys beside the two or three highways and of these highways themselves only one that which leads through the vertebrates up to man has been wide enough to allow free passage to the full breath of life we get this impression when we compare the societies of bees and ants for instance with human societies the former are admirably ordered and united but stereotyped the latter are open to every sort of progress but divided and incessantly at strife with themselves the ideal would be a society always in progress and always in equilibrium but this ideal is perhaps unrealizable the two characteristics that would fain complete each other which do complete each other in their embryonic state can no longer abide together when they grow stronger if one could speak otherwise than metaphorically of an impulse toward social life it might be said that the brunt of the impulse was borne along the line of evolution ending at man and that the rest of it was collected on the road leading to the hymenoptera the societies of ants and bees would thus present the aspect complementary to ours but this would be only a manner of expression there has been no particular impulse towards social life there is simply the general movement of life which on divergent lines is creating forms ever new if societies should appear on two of these lines they ought to show divergence of paths at the same time as community of impetus they will thus develop two classes of characteristics which we shall find vaguely complementary of each other so our study of the evolution movement will have to unravel a certain number of divergent directions and to appreciate the importance of what has happened along each of them in a word to determine the nature of the dissociated tendencies and estimate their relative proportion combining these tendencies then we shall get an approximation or rather an imitation of the indivisible motor principle whence their impetus proceeds evolution will thus prove to be something entirely different from a series of adaptations to circumstances as mechanism claims entirely different also from the realization of a plan of the whole as maintained by the doctrine of finality that adaptation to environment is the necessary condition of evolution we do not question for a moment it is quite evident that a species would disappear should it fail to bend to the conditions of existence which are imposed on it but it is one thing to recognize that outer circumstances are forces evolution must reckon with another to claim that they are the directing causes of evolution this latter theory is that of mechanism it excludes absolutely the hypothesis of an original impetus i mean an internal push that has carried life by more and more complex forms to higher and higher destinies yet this impetus is evident and a mere glance at fossil species shows us that life need not have evolved at all or might have evolved only in very restricted limits if it had chosen the alternative much more convenient to itself of becoming ankylosed in its primitive forms 
certain foraminifera have not varied since the silurian epoch unmoved witnesses of the innumerable revolutions that have upheaved our planet the linguli are to-day what they were at the remotest times of the paleozoic era the truth is that adaptation explains the sinuosities of the movement of evolution but not its general directions still less the movement itself the road that leads to the town is obliged to follow the ups and downs of the hills it adapts itself to the accidents of the ground but the accidents of the ground are not the cause of the road nor have they given it its direction at every moment they furnish it with what is indispensable namely the soil on which it lies but if we consider the whole of the road instead of each of its parts the accidents of the ground appear only as impediments or causes of delay for the road aims simply at the town and would fain be a straight line just so as regards the evolution of life and the circumstances through which it passes with this difference that evolution does not mark out a solitary route that it takes directions without aiming at ends and that it remains inventive even in its adaptations but if the evolution of life is something other than a series of adaptations to accidental circumstances so also it is not the realization of a plan a plan is given in advance it is represented or at least representable before its realization the complete execution of it may be put off to a distant future or even indefinitely but the idea is none the less formulable in the present time in terms actually given if on the contrary evolution is a creation unceasingly renewed it creates as it goes on not only the forms of life but the ideas that will enable the intellect to understand it the terms which will serve to express it that is to say that its future overflows its present and cannot be sketched out therein in an idea there is the first error of finalism it involves another yet more serious if life realizes a plan it ought to manifest a greater harmony the further it advances just as the house shows better and better the idea of the architect as stone is set upon stone if on the contrary the unity of life is to be found solely in the impetus that pushes it along the road of time the harmony is not in front but behind the unity is derived from a visa tergo it is given at the start as an impulsion not placed at the end as an attraction in communicating itself the impetus splits up more and more life in proportion to its progress is scattered in manifestations which undoubtedly owe to their common origin the fact that they are complementary to each other in certain aspects but which are none the less mutually incompatible and antagonistic so the discord between species will go on increasing indeed we have as yet only indicated the essential cause of it we have supposed for the sake of simplicity that each species received the impulsion in order to pass it on to others and that in every direction in which life evolves the propagation is in a straight line but as a matter of fact there are species which are arrested there are some that retrogress evolution is not only a movement forward in many cases we observe a marking time and still more often a deviation or turning back it must be so as we shall show further on and the same causes that divide the evolution movement often cause life to be diverted from itself hypnotized by the form it has just brought forth thence results an increasing disorder no doubt there is progress if progress mean a continual advance in the general direction determined by a first impulsion but this progress is accomplished only on the two or three great lines of evolution on which forms ever more and more complex ever more and more high appear between these lines run a crowd of minor paths in which on the contrary deviations arrests and setbacks are multiplied the philosopher who begins by laying down as a principle that each detail is connected with some general plan of the whole goes from one disappointment to another as soon as he comes to examine the facts and as he had put everything in the same rank he finds that as the result of not allowing for accident he must regard everything as accidental for accident then an allowance must first be made and a very liberal allowance we must recognize that all is not coherent in nature by so doing we shall be led to ascertain the centers around which the incoherence crystallizes this crystallization itself will clarify the rest the main directions will appear in which life is moving whilst developing the original impulse true we shall not witness the detailed accomplishment of a plan nature is more and better than a plan in course of realization a plan is a term assigned to a labor it closes the future whose form it indicates 
before the evolution of life on the contrary the portals of the future remain wide open it is a creation that goes on forever in virtue of an initial movement this movement constitutes the unity of the organized world a prolific unity of an infinite richness superior to any that the intellect could dream of for the intellect is only one of its aspects or products but it is easier to define the method than to apply it the complete interpretation of the evolution movement in the past as we conceive it would be possible only if the history of the development of the organized world were entirely known such is far from being the case the genealogies proposed for the different species are generally questionable they vary with their authors with the theoretic views inspiring them and raise discussions to which the present state of science does not admit of a final settlement but a comparison of the different solutions shows that the controversy bears less on the main lines of the movement than on matters of detail and so by following the main lines as closely as possible we shall be sure of not going astray moreover they alone are important to us for we do not aim like the naturalist at finding the order of succession of different species but only at defining the principal directions of their evolution and not all of these directions have the same interest for us what concerns us particularly is the path that leads to man we shall therefore not lose sight of the fact in following one direction and another that our main business is to determine the relation of man to the animal kingdom and the place of the animal kingdom itself in the organized world as a whole end of section five section six of evolution creatrice by henri bergson translated by arthur mitchell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two part two to begin with the second point let us say that no definite characteristic distinguishes the plant from the animal attempts to define the two kingdoms strictly have always come to naught there is not a single property of vegetable life that is not found in some degree in certain animals not a single characteristic feature of the animal that has not been seen in certain species or at certain moments in the vegetable world naturally therefore biologists enamoured of clean-cut concepts have regarded the distinction between the two kingdoms as artificial they would be right if definition in this case must be made as in the mathematical and physical sciences according to certain statical attributes which belong to the object defined and are not found in any other very different in our opinion is the kind of definition which befits the sciences of life there is no manifestation of life which does not contain in a rudimentary state either latent or potential the essential characters of most other manifestations the difference is in the proportions but this very difference of proportion will suffice to define the group if we can establish that it is not accidental and that the group as it evolves tends more and more to emphasize these particular characters in a word the group must not be defined by the possession of certain characters but by its tendency to emphasize them from this point of view taking tendencies rather than states into account we find that vegetables and animals may be precisely defined and distinguished and that they correspond to two divergent developments of life this divergence is shown first in the method of alimentation we know that the vegetable derives directly from the air and water and soil the elements necessary to maintain life especially carbon and nitrogen which it takes in mineral form the animal on the contrary cannot assimilate these elements unless they have already been fixed for it in organic substances by plants or by animals which directly or indirectly owe them to plants so that ultimately the vegetable nourishes the animal true this law allows of many exceptions among vegetables we do not hesitate to class amongst vegetables the drosera the dionia the pinguicola which are insectivorous plants on the other hand the fungi which occupy so considerable a place in the vegetable world feed like animals whether they are ferments saprophytes or parasites it is to already formed organic substances that they owe their nourishment it is therefore impossible to draw from this difference any static definition such as would automatically settle in any particular case the question whether we are dealing with a plant or an animal but the difference may provide the beginning of a dynamic definition of the two kingdoms in that it marks the two divergent directions in which vegetables and animals have taken their course it is a remarkable fact that the fungi which nature has spread all over the earth in such extraordinary profusion have not been able to evolve 
organically they do not rise above tissues which in the higher vegetables are formed in the embryonic sac of the ovary and precede the germinative development of the new individual they might be called the abortive children of the vegetable world their different species are like so many blind alleys as if by renouncing the mode of alimentation customary amongst vegetables they had been brought to a standstill on the highway of vegetable evolution as to the drosera the dionia and insectivorous plants in general they are fed by their roots like other plants they too fix by their green parts the carbon of the carbonic acid in the atmosphere their faculty of capturing absorbing and digesting insects must have arisen late in quite exceptional cases where the soil was too poor to furnish sufficient nourishment in a general way then if we attach less importance to the presence of special characters than to their tendency to develop and if we regard as essential that tendency along which evolution has been able to continue indefinitely we may say that vegetables are distinguished from animals by their power of creating organic matter out of mineral elements which they draw directly from the air and earth and water but now we come to another difference deeper than this though not unconnected with it the animal being unable to fix directly the carbon and nitrogen which are everywhere to be found has to seek for its nourishment vegetables which have already fixed these elements or animals which have taken them from the vegetable kingdom so the animal must be able to move from the amoeba which thrusts out its pseudopodia at random to seize the organic matter scattered in a drop of water up to the higher animals which have sense organs with which to recognize their prey locomotor organs to go and seize it and a nervous system to coordinate their movements with their sensations animal life is characterized in its general direction by mobility in space in its most rudimentary form the animal is a tiny mass of protoplasm enveloped at most in a thin albuminous pellicle which allows full freedom for change of shape and movement the vegetable cell on the contrary is surrounded by a membrane of cellulose which condemns it to immobility and from the bottom to the top of the vegetable kingdom there are the same habits growing more and more sedentary the plant having no need to move and finding around it in the air and water and soil in which it is placed the mineral elements it can appropriate directly it is true that phenomena of movement are seen in plants darwin has written a well-known work on the movements of climbing plants he studied also the contrivances of certain insectivorous plants such as the drosera and the dionia to seize their prey the leaf movements of the acacia the sensitive plant etc are well known moreover the circulation of the vegetable protoplasm within its sheath bears witness to its relationship to the protoplasm of animals whilst in a large number of animal species generally parasites phenomena of fixation analogous to those of vegetables can be observed here again it would be a mistake to claim that fixity and mobility are the two characters which enable us to decide by simple inspection alone whether we have before us a plant or an animal but fixity in the animal generally seems like a torpor into which the species has fallen a refusal to evolve further in a certain direction it is closely akin to parasitism and is accompanied by features that recall those of vegetable life on the other hand the movements of vegetables have neither the frequency nor the variety of those of animals generally they involve only part of the organism and scarcely ever extend to the whole in the exceptional cases in which a vague spontaneity appears in vegetables it is as if we beheld the accidental awakening of an activity normally asleep in short although both mobility and fixity exist in the vegetable as in the animal world the balance is clearly in favor of fixity in the one case and of mobility in the other these two opposite tendencies are so plainly directive of the two evolutions that the two kingdoms might almost be defined by them but fixity and mobility again are only superficial signs of tendencies that are still deeper between mobility and consciousness there is an obvious relationship no doubt the consciousness of the higher organisms seems bound up with certain cerebral arrangements the more the nervous system develops the more numerous and more precise become the movements among which it can choose the clearer also is the consciousness that accompanies them but neither this mobility nor this choice nor consequently this consciousness involves as a necessary condition the presence of a nervous system the latter has only canalized indefinite directions and brought up to a higher degree of intensity a rudimentary and vague activity diffused throughout the mass of the organized substance the lower we descend in the animal series the more the nervous centers are simplified and the more too they separate from each other till finally the nervous elements disappear 
merged in the mass of a less differentiated organism but it is the same with all the other apparatus with all the other anatomical elements and it would be as absurd to refuse consciousness to an animal because it has no brain as to declare it incapable of nourishing itself because it has no stomach the truth is that the nervous system arises like the other systems from a division of labor it does not create the function it only brings it to a higher degree of intensity and precision by giving it the double form of reflex and voluntary activity to accomplish a true reflex movement a whole mechanism is necessary set up in the spinal cord or the medulla to choose voluntarily between several definite courses of action cerebral centers are necessary that is crossways from which paths start leading to motor mechanisms of diverse form but equal precision but where nervous elements are not yet canalized still less concentrated into a system there is something from which by a kind of splitting both the reflex and the voluntary will arise something which has neither the mechanical precision of the former nor the intelligent hesitations of the latter but which partaking of both it may be infinitesimally is a reaction simply undecided and therefore vaguely conscious this amounts to saying that the humblest organism is conscious in proportion to its power to move freely is consciousness here in relation to movement the effect or the cause in one sense it is the cause since it has to direct locomotion but in another sense it is the effect for it is the motor activity that maintains it and once this activity disappears consciousness dies away or rather falls asleep in crustaceans such as the rhizocephala which must formerly have shown a more differentiated structure fixity and parasitism accompany the degeneration and almost complete disappearance of the nervous system since in such a case the progress of organization must have localized all the conscious activity in nervous centers we may conjecture that consciousness is even weaker in animals of this kind than in organisms much less differentiated which have never had nervous centers but have remained mobile how then could the plant which is fixed in the earth and finds its food on the spot have developed in the direction of conscious activity the membrane of cellulose in which the protoplasm wraps itself up not only prevents the simplest vegetable organism from moving but screens it also in some measure from those outer stimuli which act on the sensibility of the animal as irritants and prevent it from going to sleep the plant is therefore unconscious here again however we must beware of radical distinctions unconscious and conscious are not two labels which can be mechanically fastened the one on every vegetable cell the other on all animals while consciousness sleeps in the animal which has degenerated into a motionless parasite it probably awakens in the vegetable that has regained liberty of movement and awakens in just the degree to which the vegetable has reconquered this liberty nevertheless consciousness and unconsciousness mark the directions in which the two kingdoms have developed in this sense that to find the best specimens of consciousness in the animal we must ascend to the highest representatives of the series whereas to find probable cases of vegetable consciousness we must descend as low as possible in the scale of plants down to the zoospores of the algae for instance and more generally to those unicellular organisms which may be said to hesitate between the vegetable form and animality from this standpoint and in this measure we should define the animal by sensibility and awakened consciousness the vegetable by consciousness asleep and by insensibility to sum up the vegetable manufactures organic substances directly with mineral substances as a rule this aptitude enables it to dispense with movement and so with feeling animals which are obliged to go in search of their food have evolved in the direction of locomotor activity and consequently of a consciousness more and more distinct more and more ample now it seems to us most probable that the animal cell and the vegetable cell are derived from a common stock and that the first living organisms oscillated between the vegetable and animal form participating in both at once indeed we have just seen that the characteristic tendencies of the evolution of the two kingdoms although divergent coexist even now both in the plant and in the animal the proportion alone differs ordinarily one of the two tendencies covers or crushes down the other but in exceptional circumstances the suppressed one starts up and regains the place it had lost the mobility and consciousness of the vegetable cell are not so sound asleep that they cannot rouse themselves when circumstances permit or demand it and on the other hand the evolution of the animal kingdom has always been retarded or stopped or dragged back by the tendency it has kept toward the vegetative life 
however full however overflowing the activity of an animal species may appear torpor and unconsciousness are always lying in wait for it it keeps up its role only by effort at the price of fatigue along the route on which the animal has evolved there have been numberless shortcomings and cases of decay generally associated with parasitic habits there are so many shuntings onto the vegetative life thus everything bears out the belief that vegetable and animal are descended from a common ancestor which united the tendencies of both in a rudimentary state but the two tendencies mutually implied in this rudimentary form became dissociated as they grew hence the world of plants with its fixity and insensibility hence the animals with their mobility and consciousness there is no need in order to explain this dividing into two to bring in any mysterious force it is enough to point out that the living being leans naturally toward what is most convenient to it and that vegetables and animals have chosen two different kinds of convenience in the way of procuring the carbon and nitrogen they need vegetables continually and mechanically draw these elements from an environment that continually provides it animals by action that is discontinuous concentrated in certain moments and conscious go to find these bodies in organisms that have already fixed them they are two different ways of being industrious or perhaps we may prefer to say of being idle for this very reason we doubt whether nervous elements however rudimentary will ever be found in the plant what corresponds in it to the directing will of the animal is we believe the direction in which it bends the energy of the solar radiation when it uses it to break the connection of the carbon with the oxygen in carbonic acid what corresponds in it to the sensibility of the animal is the impressionability quite of its kind of its chlorophyll light now a nervous system being pre-eminently a mechanism which serves as intermediary between sensations and volitions the true nervous system of the plant seems to be the mechanism or rather chemicism sui generis which serves as intermediary between the impressionability of its chlorophyll to light and the producing of starch which amounts to saying that the plant can have no nervous elements and that the same impetus that has led the animal to give itself nerves and nerve centers must have ended in the plant in the chlorophyllian function the first glance over the organized world will enable us to ascertain more precisely what unites the two kingdoms and also what separates them suppose as we suggested in the preceding chapter that at the root of life there is an effort to engraft onto the necessity of physical forces the largest possible amount of indetermination this effort cannot result in the creation of energy or if it does the quantity created does not belong to the order of magnitude apprehended by our senses and instruments of measurement our experience and science all that the effort can do then is to make the best of a pre-existing energy which it finds at its disposal now it finds only one way of succeeding in this namely to secure such an accumulation of potential energy from matter that it can get at any moment the amount of work it needs for its action simply by pulling a trigger the effort itself possesses only that power of releasing but the work of releasing although always the same and always smaller than any given quantity will be the more effective the heavier the weight it makes fall and the greater the height or in other words the greater the sum of potential energy accumulated and disposable as a matter of fact the principal source of energy usable on the surface of our planet is the sun so the problem was this to obtain from the sun that it should partially and provisionally suspend here and there on the surface of the earth its continual outpour of usable energy and store a certain quantity of it in the form of unused energy in appropriate reservoirs whence it could be drawn at the desired moment at the desired spot in the desired direction the substances forming the food of animals are just such reservoirs made of very complex molecules holding a considerable amount of chemical energy in the potential state they are like explosives which only need a spark to set free the energy stored within them now it is probable that life tended at the beginning to compass at one and the same time both the manufacture of the explosive and the explosion by which it is utilized in this case the same organism that had directly stored the energy of the solar radiation would have expended it in free movements in space and for that reason we must presume that the first living beings sought on the one hand to accumulate without ceasing energy borrowed from the sun and on the other hand to expend it in a discontinuous and explosive way in movements of locomotion even today perhaps a chlorophyll bearing infusorian such as the euglena may symbolize this primordial tendency of life though in a mean form incapable of evolving 
is the divergent development of the two kingdoms related to what one may call the oblivion of each kingdom as regards one of the two halves of the program or rather which is more likely was the very nature of the matter that life found confronting it on our planet opposed to the possibility of the two tendencies evolving very far together in the same organism what is certain is that the vegetable has trended principally in the first direction and the animal in the second but if from the very first in making the explosive nature had for object the explosion then it is the evolution of the animal rather than that of the vegetable that indicates on the whole the fundamental direction of life the harmony of the two kingdoms the complementary characters they display might then be due to the fact that they develop two tendencies which at first were fused in one the more the single original tendency grows the harder it finds it to keep united in the same living being those two elements which in the rudimentary state implied each other hence a parting in two hence two divergent evolutions hence also two series of characters opposed in certain points complementary in others but whether opposed or complementary always preserving an appearance of kinship while the animal evolved not without accidents along the way toward a freer and freer expenditure of discontinuous energy the plant perfected rather its system of accumulation without moving we shall not dwell on this second point suffice it to say that the plant must have been greatly benefited in its turn by a new division analogous to that between plants and animals while the primitive vegetable cell had to fix by itself both its carbon and its nitrogen it became able almost to give up the second of these two functions as soon as microscopic vegetables came forward which leaned in this direction exclusively and even specialized diversely in this still complicated business the microbes that fix the nitrogen of the air and those which convert the ammoniacal compounds into nitrous ones and these again into nitrates have by the same splitting up of a tendency primitively one rendered to the whole vegetable world the same kind of service as the vegetables in general have rendered to animals if a special kingdom were to be made for these microscopic vegetables it might be said that in the microbes of the soil the vegetables and the animals we have before us the analysis carried out by the matter that life found at its disposal on our planet of all that life contained at the outset in a state of reciprocal implication is this properly speaking a division of labor these words do not give the exact idea of evolution such as we conceive it wherever there is division of labor there is association and also convergence of effort now the evolution we are speaking of is never achieved by means of association but by dissociation it never tends toward convergence but toward divergence of efforts the harmony between terms that are mutually complementary in certain points is not in our opinion produced in course of progress by a reciprocal adaptation on the contrary it is complete only at the start it arises from an original identity from the fact that the evolutionary process splaying out like a sheaf sunders in proportion to their simultaneous growth terms which at first completed each other so well that they coalesced now the elements into which a tendency splits up are far from possessing the same importance or above all the same power to evolve we have just distinguished three different kingdoms if one may so express it in the organized world while the first comprises only microorganisms which have remained in the rudimentary state animals and vegetables have taken their flight toward very lofty fortunes such indeed is generally the case when a tendency divides among the divergent developments to which it gives rise some go on indefinitely others come more or less quickly to the end of their tether these latter do not issue directly from the primitive tendency but from one of the elements into which it has divided they are residual developments made and left behind on the way by some truly elementary tendency which continues to evolve now these truly elementary tendencies we think bear a mark by which they may be recognized this mark is like a trace still visible in each of what was in the original tendency of which they represent the elementary directions the elements of a tendency are not like objects set beside each other in space and mutually exclusive but rather like psychic states each of which although it be itself to begin with yet partakes of others and so virtually includes in itself the whole personality to which it belongs there is no real manifestation of life we said that does not show us in a rudimentary or latent state the characters of other manifestations conversely when we meet on one line of evolution a recollection so to speak of what is developed along other lines we must conclude that we have before us 
dissociated elements of one and the same original tendency in this sense vegetables and animals represent the two great divergent developments of life though the plant is distinguished from the animal by fixity and insensibility movement and consciousness sleep in it as recollections which may waken but beside these normally sleeping recollections there are others awake and active just those namely whose activity does not obstruct the development of the elementary tendency itself we may then formulate this law when a tendency splits up in the course of its development each of the special tendencies which thus arise tries to preserve and develop everything in the primitive tendency that is not incompatible with the work for which it is specialized this explains precisely the fact we dwelt on in the preceding chapter, namely, the formation of identical complex mechanisms on independent lines of evolution. Certain deep-seated analogies between the animal and the vegetable have probably no other cause. Sexual generation is perhaps only a luxury for the plant, but to the animal it was a necessity, and the plant must have been driven to it by the same impetus which impelled the animal thereto, a primitive, original impetus, anterior to the separation of the two kingdoms the same may be said of the tendency of the vegetable towards a growing complexity this tendency is essential to the animal kingdom ever tormented by the need of more and more extended and effective action but the vegetable condemned to fixity and insensibility exhibits the same tendency only because it received at the outset the same impulsion recent experiments show that it varies at random when the period of mutation arrives whereas the animal must have evolved we believe in much more definite directions but we will not dwell further on this original doubling of the modes of life let us come to the evolution of animals in which we are more particularly interested what constitutes animality we said is the faculty of utilizing a releasing mechanism for the conversion of as much stored up potential energy as possible into explosive actions in the beginning the explosion is haphazard and does not choose its direction thus the amoeba thrusts out its pseudopodic prolongations in all directions at once but as we rise in the animal scale the form of the body itself is observed to indicate a certain number of very definite directions along which the energy travels these directions are marked by so many chains of nervous elements now the nervous element has gradually emerged from the barely differentiated mass of organized tissue it may therefore be surmised that in the nervous element as soon as it appears and also in its appendages the faculty of suddenly freeing the gradually stored up energy is concentrated no doubt every living cell expends energy without ceasing in order to maintain its equilibrium the vegetable cell torpid from the start is entirely absorbed in this work of maintenance alone as if it took for an end what must at first have been only a means but in the animal all points to action that is to the utilization of energy for movements from place to place true every animal cell expends a good deal often the whole of the energy at its disposal in keeping itself alive but the organism as a whole tries to attract as much energy as possible to those points where the locomotive movements are effected so that where a nervous system exists with its complementary sense organs and motor apparatus everything should happen as if the rest of the body had as its essential function to prepare for these and pass on to them at the moment required that force which they are to liberate by a sort of explosion the part played by food amongst the higher animals is indeed extremely complex in the first place it serves to repair tissues then it provides the animal with the heat necessary to render it as independent as possible of changes in external temperature thus it preserves supports and maintains the organism in which the nervous system is set and on which the nervous elements have to live but these nervous elements would have no reason for existence if the organism did not pass to them and especially to the muscles they control a certain energy to expend and it may even be conjectured that there in the main is the essential and ultimate destination of food this does not mean that the greater part of the food is used in this work a state may have to make enormous expenditure to secure the return of taxes and the sum which it will have to dispose of after deducting the cost of collection will perhaps be very small that sum is none the less the reason for the tax and for all that has been spent to obtain its return so it is with the energy which the animal demands of its food many facts seem to indicate that the nervous and muscular elements stand in this relation towards the rest of the organism glance first at the distribution of alimentary substances among the different elements of the living body 
these substances fall into two classes one the quaternary or albuminoid the other the ternary including the carbohydrates and the fats the albuminoids are properly plastic destined to repair the tissues although owing to the carbon they contain they are capable of providing energy on occasion but the function of supplying energy has devolved more particularly on the second class of substances these being deposited in the cell rather than forming part of its substance convey to it in the form of chemical potential an expansive energy that may be directly converted into either movement or heat in short the chief function of the albuminoids is to repair the machine while the function of the other class of substances is to supply power it is natural that the albuminoids should have no specially allotted destination since every part of the machine has to be maintained but not so with the other substances the carbohydrates are distributed very unequally and this inequality of distribution seems to us in the highest degree instructive conveyed by the arterial blood in the form of glucose these substances are deposited in the form of glycogen in the different cells forming the tissues we know that one of the principal functions of the liver is to maintain at a constant level the quantity of glucose held by the blood by means of the reserves of glycogen secreted by the hepatic cells now in this circulation of glucose and accumulation of glycogen it is easy to see that the effect is as if the whole effort of the organism were directed towards providing with potential energy the elements of both the muscular and the nervous tissues the organism proceeds differently in the two cases but it arrives at the same result in the first case it provides the muscle cell with a large reserve deposited in advance the quantity of glycogen contained in the muscles is indeed enormous in comparison with what is found in the other tissues in the nervous tissue on the contrary the reserve is small the nervous elements whose function is merely to liberate the potential energy stored in the muscle never have to furnish much work at one time but the remarkable thing is that this reserve is restored by the blood at the very moment that it is expended so that the nerve is instantly recharged with potential energy muscular tissue and nervous tissue are therefore both privileged the one in that it is stocked with a large reserve of energy the other in that it is always served at the instant it is in need and to the exact extent of its requirements more particularly it is from the sensory motor system that the call for glycogen the potential energy comes as if the rest of the organism were simply there in order to transmit force to the nervous system and to the muscles which the nerves control true when we think of the part played by the nervous system even the sensory motor system as regulator of the organic life it may well be asked whether in this exchange of good offices between it and the rest of the body the nervous system is indeed a master that the body serves but we shall already incline to this hypothesis when we consider even in the static state only the distribution of potential energy among the tissues and we shall be entirely convinced of it when we reflect upon the conditions in which the energy is expended and restored for suppose the sensory motor system is a system like the others of the same rank as the others borne by the whole of the organism it will wait until an excess of chemical potential is supplied to it before it performs any work in other words it is the production of glycogen which will regulate the consumption by the nerves and muscles on the contrary if the sensory motor system is the actual master the duration and extent of its action will be independent to a certain extent at least of the reserve of glycogen that it holds and even of that contained in the whole of the organism it will perform work and the other tissues will have to arrange as they can to supply it with potential energy now this is precisely what does take place as is shown in particular by the experiments of morat and dufour while the glycogenic function of the liver depends on the action of the excitory nerves which control it the action of these nerves is subordinated to the action of those which stimulate the locomotor muscles in this sense that the muscles begin by expending without calculation thus consuming glycogen impoverishing the blood of its glucose and finally causing the liver which has had to pour into the impoverished blood some of its reserve of glycogen to manufacture a fresh supply from the sensory motor system then everything starts on that system everything converges and we may say without metaphor that the rest of the organism is at its service consider again what happens in a prolonged fast it is a remarkable fact that in animals that have died of hunger the brain is found to be almost unimpaired while the other organs have lost more or less of their weight and their cells have undergone profound changes it seems as though the rest of the body had sustained the nervous system to the last extremity treating itself simply as the means of which the nervous system is the end to sum up 
if we agree in short to understand by the sensory motor system the cerebrospinal nervous system together with the sensorial apparatus in which it is prolonged and the locomotor muscles it controls we may say that a higher organism is essentially a sensory motor system installed on systems of digestion respiration circulation secretion etc whose function it is to repair cleanse and protect it to create an unvarying internal environment for it and above all to pass it potential energy to convert into locomotive movement it is true that the more the nervous function is perfected the more must the functions required to maintain it develop and the more exacting consequently they become for themselves as the nervous activity has emerged from the protoplasmic mass in which it was almost drowned it has had to summon around itself activities of all kinds for its support these could only be developed on other activities which again implied others and so on indefinitely thus it is that the complexity of functioning of the higher organisms goes on to infinity the study of one of these organisms therefore takes us round in a circle as if everything was a means to everything else but the circle has a centre none the less and that is the system of nervous elements stretching between the sensory organs and the motor apparatus we will not dwell here on a point we have treated at length in a former work let us merely recall that the progress of the nervous system has been effected both in the direction of a more precise adaptation of movements and in that of a greater latitude left to the living being to choose between them these two tendencies may appear antagonistic and indeed they are so but a nervous chain even in its most rudimentary form successfully reconciles them on the one hand it marks a well-defined track between one point of the periphery and another the one sensory the other motor it has therefore canalized an activity which was originally diffused in the protoplasmic mass but on the other hand the elements that compose it are probably discontinuous at any rate even supposing they anastomose they exhibit a functional discontinuity for each of them ends in a kind of crossroad where probably the nervous current may choose its course from the humblest monera to the best endowed insects and up to the most intelligent vertebrates the progress realized has been above all a progress of the nervous system coupled at every stage with all the new constructions and complications of mechanism that this progress required as we foreshadowed in the beginning of this work the role of life is to insert some indetermination into matter indeterminate that is unforeseeable are the forms it creates in the course of its evolution more and more indeterminate also more and more free is the activity to which these forms serve as the vehicle a nervous system with neurons placed end to end in such wise that at the extremity of each manifold ways open in which manifold questions present themselves is a veritable reservoir of indetermination that the main energy of the vital impulse has been spent in creating apparatus of this kind is we believe what a glance over the organized world as a whole easily shows but concerning the vital impulse itself a few explanations are necessary it must not be forgotten that the force which is evolving throughout the organized world is a limited force which is always seeking to transcend itself and always remains inadequate to the work it would fain produce the errors and puerilities of radical finalism are due to the misapprehension of this point it has represented the whole of the living world as a construction and a construction analogous to a human work all the pieces have been arranged with a view to the best possible functioning of the machine each species has its reason for existence its part to play its allotted place and all join together as it were in a musical concert wherein the seeming discords are really meant to bring out a fundamental harmony in short all goes on in nature as in the works of human genius where though the result may be trifling there is at least perfect adequacy between the object made and the work of making it nothing of the kind in the evolution of life there the disproportion is striking between the work and the result from the bottom to the top of the organized world we do indeed find one great effort but most often this effort turns short sometimes paralyzed by contrary forces sometimes diverted from what it should do by what it does absorbed by the form it is engaged in taking hypnotized by it as by a mirror even in its most perfect works though it seems to have triumphed over external resistances and also over its own it is at the mercy of the materiality which it has had to assume it is what each of us may experience in himself our freedom in the very movements by which it is affirmed creates the growing habits that will stifle it if it fails to renew itself by a constant effort it is dogged by automatism 
the most living thought becomes frigid in the formula that expresses it the word turns against the idea the letter kills the spirit and our most ardent enthusiasm as soon as it is externalized into action is so naturally congealed into the cold calculation of interest or vanity the one takes so easily the shape of the other that we might confuse them together doubt our own sincerity deny goodness and love if we did not know that the dead retain for a time the features of the living the profound cause of this discordance lies in an irremediable difference of rhythm life in general is mobility itself particular manifestations of life accept this mobility reluctantly and constantly lag behind it is always going ahead they want to mark time evolution in general would fain go on in a straight line each special evolution is a kind of circle like eddies of dust raised by the wind as it passes the living turn upon themselves borne up by the great blast of life they are therefore relatively stable and counterfeit immobility so well that we treat each of them as a thing rather than as a progress forgetting that the very permanence of their form is only the outline of a movement at times however in a fleeting vision the invisible breath that bears them is materialized before our eyes we have this sudden illumination before certain forms of maternal love so striking and in most animals so touching observable even in the solicitude of the plant for its seed this love in which some have seen the great mystery of life may possibly deliver us life's secret it shows us each generation leaning over the generation that shall follow it allows us a glimpse of the fact that the living being is above all a thoroughfare and that the essence of life is in the movement by which life is transmitted this contrast between life in general and the forms in which it is manifested has everywhere the same character it might be said that life tends toward the utmost possible action but that each species prefers to contribute the slightest possible effort regarded in what constitutes its true essence namely as a transition from species to species life is a continually growing action but each of the species through which life passes aims only at its own convenience it goes for that which demands the least labor absorbed in the form it is about to take it falls into a partial sleep in which it ignores almost all the rest of life it fashions itself so as to take the greatest possible advantage of its immediate environment with the least possible trouble accordingly the act by which life goes forward to the creation of a new form and the act by which this form is shaped are two different and often antagonistic movements the first is continuous with the second but cannot continue in it without being drawn aside from its direction as would happen to a man leaping if in order to clear the obstacle he had to turn his eyes from it and look at himself all the while living forms are by their very definition forms that are able to live in whatever way the adaptation of the organism to its circumstances is explained it has necessarily been sufficient since the species has subsisted in this sense each of the successive species that paleontology and zoology describes was a success carried off by life but we get a very different impression when we refer each species to the movement that has left it behind on its way instead of to the conditions into which it has been set often this movement has turned aside very often too it has stopped short what was to have been a thoroughfare has become a terminus from this new point of view failure seems the rule success exceptional and always imperfect we shall see that of the four main directions along which animal life bent its course two have led to blind alleys and in the other two the effort has generally been out of proportion to the result documents are lacking to reconstruct this history in detail but we can make out its main lines we have already said that animals and vegetables must have separated soon from their common stock the vegetable falling asleep in immobility the animal on the contrary becoming more and more awake and marching on to the conquest of a nervous system probably the effort of the animal kingdom resulted in creating organisms still very simple but endowed with a certain freedom of action and above all with a shape so undecided that it could lend itself to any future determination these animals may have resembled some of our worms but with this difference however that the worms living today to which they could be compared are but the empty and fixed examples of infinitely plastic forms pregnant with an unlimited future the common stock of the echinoderms mollusks arthropods and vertebrates one danger lay in wait for them one obstacle which might have stopped the soaring course of animal life 
there is one peculiarity with which we cannot help being struck when glancing over the fauna of primitive times namely the imprisonment of the animal in a more or less solid sheath which must have obstructed and often even paralyzed its movements the mollusks of that time had a shell more universally than those of today the arthropods in general were provided with a carapace most of them were crustaceans the more ancient fishes had a bony sheath of extreme hardness the explanation of this general fact should be sought we believe in a tendency of soft organisms to defend themselves against one another by making themselves as far as possible undevourable each species in the act by which it comes into being trends towards that which is most expedient just as among primitive organisms there were some that turned towards animal life by refusing to manufacture organic out of inorganic material and taking organic substances ready-made from organisms that had turned towards the vegetative life so among the animal species themselves many contrived to live at the expense of other animals for an organism that is animal that is to say mobile can avail itself of its mobility to go in search of defenceless animals and feed on them quite as well as on vegetables so the more species became mobile the more they became voracious and dangerous to one another hence a sudden arrest of the entire animal world in its progress towards higher and higher mobility for the hard and calcareous skin of the echinoderm the shell of the mollusk the carapace of the crustacean and the ganoid breastplate of the ancient fishes probably all originated in a common effort of the animal species to protect themselves against hostile species but this breastplate behind which the animal took shelter constrained it in its movements and sometimes fixed it in one place if the vegetable renounced consciousness in wrapping itself in a cellulose membrane the animal that shut itself up in a citadel or in armour condemned itself to a partial slumber in this torpor the echinoderms and even the mollusks live today probably arthropods and vertebrates were threatened with it too they escaped however and to this fortunate circumstance is due the expansion of the highest forms of life in two directions in fact we see the impulse of life to movement getting the upper hand again the fishes exchanged their ganoid breastplate for scales long before that the insects had appeared also disencumbered of the breastplate that had protected their ancestors both supplemented the insufficiency of their protective covering by an agility that enabled them to escape their enemies and also to assume the offensive to choose the place and the moment of encounter we see a progress of the same kind in the evolution of human armaments the first impulse is to seek shelter the second which is the better is to become as supple as possible for flight and above all for attack attack being the most effective means of defence so the heavy hoplite was supplanted by the legionary the knight clad in armour had to give place to the light free-moving infantryman and in a general way in the evolution of life just as in the evolution of human societies and of individual destinies the greatest successes have been for those who have accepted the heaviest risks evidently then it was to the animal's interest to make itself more mobile as we said when speaking of adaptation in general any transformation of a species can be explained by its own particular interest this will give the immediate cause of the variation but often only the most superficial cause the profound cause is the impulse which thrust life into the world which made it divide into vegetables and animals which shunted the animal on to suppleness of form and which at a certain moment in the animal kingdom threatened with torpor secured that on some points at least it should rouse itself up and move forward on the two paths along which the vertebrates and arthropods have separately evolved development apart from retrogressions connected with parasitism or any other cause has consisted above all in the progress of the sensory motor nervous system mobility and suppleness were sought for and also through many experimental attempts and not without a tendency to excess of substance and brute force at the start variety of movements but this quest itself took place in divergent directions a glance at the nervous system of the arthropods and that of the vertebrates shows us the difference in the arthropods the body is formed of a series more or less long of rings set together motor activity is thus distributed amongst a varying sometimes a considerable number of appendages each of which has its special function in the vertebrates activity is concentrated in two pairs of members only and these organs perform functions which depend much less strictly on their form the independence becomes complete in man whose hand is capable of any kind of work 
that at least is what we see but behind what is seen there is what may be surmised two powers immanent in life and originally intermingled which were bound to part company in course of growth to define these powers we must consider in the evolution both of the arthropods and the vertebrates the species which mark the culminating point of each how is this point to be determined here again to aim at geometrical precision will lead us astray there is no single simple sign by which we can recognize that one species is more advanced than another on the same line of evolution there are manifold characters that must be compared and weighed in each particular case in order to ascertain to what extent they are essential or accidental and how far they must be taken into account it is unquestionable for example that success is the most general criterion of superiority the two terms being up to a certain point synonymous by success must be understood so far as the living being is concerned an aptitude to develop in the most diverse environments through the greatest possible variety of obstacles so as to cover the widest possible extent of ground a species which claims the entire earth for its domain is truly a dominating and consequently superior species such is the human species which represents the culminating point of the evolution of the vertebrates but such also are in the series of the articulate the insects and in particular certain hymenoptera it has been said of the ants that as man is lord of the soil they are lords of the subsoil on the other hand a group of species that has appeared late may be a group of degenerates but for that some special cause of retrogression must have intervened by right this group should be superior to the group from which it is derived since it would correspond to a more advanced stage of evolution now man is probably the latest comer of the vertebrates and in the insect series no species is later than the hymenoptera unless it be the lepidoptera which are probably degenerates living parasitically on flowering plants so by different ways we are led to the same conclusion the evolution of the arthropods reaches its culminating point in the insect and in particular in the hymenoptera as that of the vertebrates in man now since instinct is nowhere so developed as in the insect world and in no group of insects so marvelously as in the hymenoptera it may be said that the whole evolution of the animal kingdom apart from retrogressions towards vegetative life has taken place on two divergent paths one of which led to instinct and the other to intelligence vegetative torpor instinct and intelligence these then are the elements that coincided in the vital impulsion common to plants and animals and which in the course of a development in which they were made manifest in the most unforeseen forms have been dissociated by the very fact of their growth the cardinal error which from aristotle onwards has vitiated most of the philosophies of nature is to see in vegetative instinctive and rational life three successive degrees of the development of one and the same tendency whereas there are three divergent directions of an activity that has split up as it grew the difference between them is not a difference of intensity nor more generally of degree but of kind end of section six